Hello, and welcome to one of our two applied biology workshops as a part of our Taste of LFS virtual open house. And yeah, these workshops are intended for students who are interested in applying to LFS and just want to get an idea of some of the topics studied across our faculty. Um, and I'll preface with um, all the content in this class was inspired by two classes I took um, that were in the applied biology program. One was about insects in general, and the other was specifically about eating insects. So yeah, I was inspired by that class. Um, so here's a brief outline of what we'll be talking about today. We'll do some intros, um, including an intro to entomophagy, which is eating insects. We'll go over some nutritional and environmental benefits, and then we'll put it all together and relate it back to LFS. Um, and first and foremost, we want to acknowledge that the BC's Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Silitooth First Nations, and that we make sure that we all have an understanding of what those words um, actually mean in this context. So if you already have an idea, you can feel, the free, feel free to put your thoughts in the chat. Um, and so traditional recognizes that these lands were traditionally used by the Musqueam, Squamish, and Silitooth people among other indigenous groups. Ancestral recognizes that the land is handed down. It has been handed down from generation to generation um, long before the land has been colonized. Unceded refers to the land, refers to that the land was not turned over to the government by a treaty or any other agreement um, that it was forcibly taken without consent and that we were on stolen land. So as you begin your journey at UBC um, or wherever you end up, take some time to learn about the history of this land and honor its original inhabitants and look into whose traditional territory that you may be occupying. Um, it doesn't take long to do just the bare minimum amount of research. So, um, and it's always good to keep reading and um, like keep learning. So uh, I'm tuning in from East Van today, which um, with just some brief research is the land of the Salatooth, Squamish, Stolo, Shamanis, Musqueam and Salatooth peoples. Um, and yeah, so wherever you go, just uh, take a moment to recognize whose land that you're occupying. Now for a formal introduction. So I never really introduced myself before as well. My name is Brenna Turk. I'm the one in the middle. Um, I'm in my third year in the Applied Animal Biology major, which is in the Applied Biology program in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Um, and I am one of the LFS ambassadors, so that means I um, work part-time for the Faculty of Land and Food Systems doing stuff like this and getting to talk to prospective students like you guys. So um, if you didn't know, the Faculty of Land and Food Systems studies science with a social impact. So we are a world leader in research, education, and service that addresses global issues connected to human health and a sustainable food supply. Um, and we're going to kind of go into what that really means um, through this presentation. Um, so let's delve into the content here. So what is entomophagy? Entomophagy is the practice of eating insects. Um, and it's actually really common all over the world. Um, uh, today, around 2 billion people in around 113 countries rely on insects as a source of protein and nutrients with 2,000 unique insect species being reportedly eaten around the world. Um, entomophagy is gaining popularity around the world, including in Western markets recently, as the edible insect market is predicted to exceed 522 million US in the next few years. Um, this is just a really fun representation of the different insects that are most commonly eaten. So you can see that most commonly it's beetles or um, beetle larvae as well then caterpillars, which are um, the larvae of like butterflies and moths. Then you see bees, wasps, and ants, followed by grasshoppers, locusts, and crickets. Um, and then so on, it gets into like a bit of a, like a mix. You can see cicadas, leaf hoppers, um, termites, dragonflies, flies, and then just other types of insects. And just to give you an idea of kind of what is most commonly being eaten. So another poll, just to kind of get an idea of um, where we're all at, and it's like totally okay for everyone to be on different levels. Um, I wanna know how many of you have tried insects. So I'm going to ask another question here. Okay, there it is. So um, if you all wanna kind of click in and respond to which one of these best apply to you, 
whether you're like, yeah, I've already eaten insects. Like I have recipes, like don't worry about me. Um, either yes, you'd be excited to try them, maybe depending on the dish, if you thought it would be good or just definitely no. All right, five more seconds. Okay, I'll share these. So yeah, so we have a split cut. So two people have already eaten insects. We have four people that say no way. Hopefully I'll be able to um, persuade you otherwise. So yeah, that's awesome. We have a varied crowd. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, entomophagy isn't as accepted in Western markets, like we've just seen from this poll. Um, like in US, Canada, and the UK, it's not as popular as other countries, even though the aversion to eating insects is strictly cultural in origin. Um, in fact, in blind taste tests with insect-based dishes, those have shown that most people really do enjoy the taste and texture of insects once they've been properly prepared. One interesting comparison to make to insect-based foods could be sashimi and sushi rolls. Um, which, if you didn't know, in North America, the concept of eating raw fish wasn't really widely accepted until the 60s at the earliest, but um, now sushi is a super popular food and there are sushi restaurants like everywhere. They're like scattered everywhere, especially in Vancouver. Um, so now we're going to try a Zoom annotation activity. So what kinds of insect-based foods do you know of, have you heard of, or maybe have you tried them? Um, so again, if you go up to the top of your screen, you can click view options and then hit annotate and there should be, um, it should give you an option to annotate. Um, there should be like a little text option. You can type in your thoughts or um, if you don't want to annotate, you can also just put them directly in the chat. So what have you tried or heard of? Um, either annotate or put it in the chat. You can see ant lollipops. Crickets as protein. Yeah, crickets are like super high in protein. You've seen like protein powder, fried grasshoppers, lollipops, insect flour, cricket granola bars. Yeah, all of those. You see a lot of, I think one thing that you can notice is a lot of like grasshoppers, crickets. Crickets are popping out a lot. Um, or like novel foods like in candy, like lollipops or just fried things that like kind of come out and get your attention. Um, so I'm going to clear these. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great. So um, in North American and European cultures, although they totally haven't totally embraced insects as a sustainable and responsible food source, uh, their popularity is growing really fast especially Europe where they seem to be undergoing a big movement when it comes to foods containing insects. There are quite a few insect-based products currently available in European markets, including mealworm burgers, mealworm spreads, and cricket chocolate. Um, and so you'll, you can see that there's a trend, especially in Western markets, of processing insect-based foods to minimize visual associations um, in order to increase palatability and kind of cater to Western preferences. So you can see that burger on the right. Um, I believe that's like a Dutch-based insect burger. Um, and it really just looks like a Beyond Meat burger, maybe just a regular veggie burger. Um, there's no like visible insects in it. Um, and that's really just because of like the cultural aversion to eating them. Uh, whereas I think there's another burger in the Netherlands that is a mealworm burger, but it's just, it literally just looks like a bunch of mealworms like glued together into a patty. Um, so there's definitely like different markets for different taste preferences. Um, the next few slides are going to kind of show how insects have always been a part of human diets. So we'll go over some examples from different countries and highlight an insect that's commonly eaten um, in a different country and some of its like important uh, applications. So in Nigeria, the Mopani worm is a common snack. It's actually Nigeria's most widely marketed edible insect and it can sell for twice the price of beef, which really shows its value. A common way to prep it is to degut it and cook it in water and then either roast it or sun dry it uh, to be sold in markets. It's a nutritious meal as it's really high in protein, calories, and essential vitamins and minerals that most foods uh, might not contain and that people might be deficient in. In Thailand, um, 
the government has actually played a huge role in locust popularity. So if you didn't know, a locust is essentially a grasshopper that's in a mating frenzy. So they will clump and go on like in like they will swarm and that's kind of like the distinction between a grasshopper and a locust. They also get huge and their coloring gets different. Um, and so if you've heard of a locust plague, essentially when these locusts swarm, they can decimate crop populations. Um, so that can be really detrimental to farmers who are growing food and then all of a sudden all of their crops have been depleted by these locust swarms. So with uh, the help of government campaigns, they have kind of marketed locusts as a popular and nutritious snack. And so now you actually have farmers that will grow crops specifically so that locusts can eat them and then harvest the locust. So now that turns an unwanted crop pass into a lucrative um, investment option. And in Thailand, farmers can actually earn up to uh, just over $9 for about two pounds of locusts, which compared to a crop like corn or rice is like very profitable. Um, there's also a lot of research happening um, across the, and like one university in Thailand developed um, techniques to farm locusts and crickets on a commercial scale. So um, they're becoming like a larger and larger investment opportunity. In Mexico, Escamoles or immature ant pupae, which are basically ant eggs, are considered a really popular delicacy and they go back all the way to um, the Aztec. So the Aztec would have historically eaten them and now they're being sold in posh restaurants in Mexico City, uh, which is really cool. So they have like a buttery and nutty flavor apparently and they are usually cooked in like just oil with some green chilies and onions because they have a really delicate flavor and they have a texture like cottage cheese. So I think it's really cool that they have kind of uh, been there for so long and been so consistent as a part of a diet. In Burkina Faso, um, the shade tree caterpillar is thought of as a pest to some as it only eats the leaves of the shade tree plant. So on shade tree uh, or on shea butter plantations, it can be seen as a pest. However, it's uh, showing great potential in helping to provide business opportunities and income to women and children in rural communities, as well as to help cure micronutrient deficiencies as it's high in vitamins and minerals that some foods lack. So again, it's creating livelihoods and it's a nutritious source of vitamins, minerals, um, and calories and other things that your body needs to kind of stay healthy. So all in all, from those examples, it's clear how insects provide livelihoods for many communities around the world. Their harvesting creates an accessible investment option for, to farmers, um, often with high payoffs. Furthermore, if your livelihood is supported by a certain species, it does make sense that you'll have a more positive opinion surrounding the protection and conservation of that species and its natural habitat. Um, so some studies in Malawi, Congo, and Zambia have shown that the popularity of caterpillars as food plays a part in achieving better forest conservation. So not only do they have nutritional benefits and cultural and economic significance, but there are um, a lot of environmental benefits to them. Okay, so um, for those of you in the US and Canada, if anyone who said that they've never eaten insects or would never eat insects, um, you are essentially lying because there are insects in almost all the foods that you can buy at the grocery store. So these examples come from the USDA or the US Food and Drug Administration, and they are permissible levels of insects in um, food that you would eat every day. So in frozen berries, you can get an average of more than 10 whole insects per 500 grams, which excludes thrips, aphids, and mites. So um, an example of what a thrip looks like is on the right. It's those tiny little dots on that leaf. So those are like thrips, aphids, and mites are all super small. Um, and so that's not even included in the permissible amounts. In frozen broccoli, you're going to find an average of over 60 aphids, thrips, or mites per 100 grams. In ground paprika, so even in your ground spices, you'll have an average of over 75 insect fragments per every 25 grams. And in chocolate, average of 60 plus insect fragments per 100 grams. So even if you don't like it, you are definitely still eating insects. So now let's talk about some of the nutritional benefits of entomophagy. So the nutritional value of each insect will vary um, depending on what species of insect it is, um, the sex, what diet it's been eating, the developmental stage, whether that's pupae, the eggs like the Eskimoles, um, caterpillars, or if you're eating a fully developed insect. 
Um, it'll depend on the like how it's been grown, the growth environment, um, and so many other different factors. So a, it's a large body of research now is going into how to can actually control um, nutritional benefits or the nutritional value of insects and have it more consistent. Um, but generally the consensus is that most insects that are commonly eaten are rich in protein, fat, and vitamins. Um, most edible insects actually have a similar iron content to beef, um, which is really important when you think about the amount of people that suffer from anemia. Um, and then grasshoppers, crickets, termites, and mealworms have been shown to be rich in iron, zinc, calcium, copper, phosphorus, magnesium, and manganese, which are all vitamins and minerals that uh, your body does need for proper functioning. So this next chart um, I thought was a fun way that kind of directly compares nutrient contents of crickets and mealworms to commonly consumed insects to other protein um, sources. So you see there's salmon, whole eggs, beef, and tofu. So I like that there's like meat and not meat options. There's fish, there's red meat, um, eggs, and tofu. So it kind of spans the whole like spectrum of um, what people use as like main sources of protein. Uh, you can see that crickets actually are the highest in protein among any other um, protein source here, which is like really interesting because um, that could be like a very efficient source of protein. Um, can, it compares like fat contents, saturated fat. You can see that both crickets and mealworms are quite high in fiber. Um, so when compared to like beef, which has zero grams of fiber, um, and that's quite common among like beef or like a lot of protein sources, right? High in protein, very low in fiber. Um, so that's like a huge um, benefit of them. They're also high in omega-3 fatty acids, which are important for brain health. So we're gonna do another Zoom annotation here if you guys are ready for it. Um, you can also put your thoughts in the chat. Um, before we dive into the environmental benefits of insects, what do you think they could be? So what kind of benefits do you think insects could offer versus uh, traditional livestock? So rearing mealworms instead of rearing beef or cows, whether that's um, like resources or I don't know, there's think about concerns that you might have with um, like beef production or chicken production um, or like just general livestock production and then um, how they could be mitigated with insects. Carbon output, carbon footprint, yeah. Less land use, totally. Yeah, that's definitely on the right track. Less greenhouse gas emissions we have. Yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah, we're kind of thinking like, how does it compare in inputs and also in outputs? So if you think of like a cow as an input output machine, what are we putting into it and what are we getting out of it? Little water. Yeah, this is all really, really great. You are all on the right track. Exactly. Okay. Give it five more seconds. Okay. So yeah, you all hit it spot on. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. So let's start with what the issue is and why we're actually looking for a more sustainable food source. Well, um, by 2050, the global population is expected to reach 9 billion. That's a lot of people. And that puts a lot more pressure on land, soil, oceans, and the water that we use to feed all of those people. Um, and current agricultural practices are responsible for about 15% of total greenhouse gases emitted, which contribute to climate change and global warming. Um, so if you've heard of the greenhouse gas effect, um, all of these gases are being emitted and reflected into our atmosphere, essentially, um, and warming the earth and having a lot of other uh, consequences. And so at the rate we're going, deforestation and environmental degradation are set to continue um, and further degrade our resources. And livestock production currently accounts for 70% of all agricultural land use. That is land that is currently housing livestock, that is growing food to feed that livestock, um, like think about how many, how much land is devoted to crops that just feeds livestock that then we eat. Um, so there's a lot of energy lost in that process. Furthermore, the global demand for meat 
is expected to increase by 70 to 80 percent between 2012 and 2050. So that's a lot of resources that we don't have that are being used up. So now what are some solutions and how can we use insects to be a part of that solution? Well, there are currently studies using organic waste that's already a byproduct of current processes that would otherwise just be going to waste um, to actually feed insects that reduce environmental contamination and that also adds value to that waste. That's another way that these farmers who create that waste can um, profit off of it. Um, as well as what you guys said, insects produce fewer greenhouse gases, especially um, ammonia, um, yeah, ammonia um, and uh, methane, which are um, largely produced by livestock. Um, they also require significantly less water than livestock. They are about at a similar, there's a few studies on raising like mealworms and crickets and comparing their water footprint with the water footprint of livestock. And they um, compare at just a little bit less than chickens or maybe on par with chickens, depending on the processes used. So um, compared to beef, a lot less. Um, also, depending on how you look at it, there could be less animal welfare concerns. Um, so when you think of people who maybe don't eat meat for ethical reasons, insects might be an alternative. However, we don't know as much about how insects feel pain. So it's still a highly contested area. Um, lastly, um, insects pose a lower risk of transmitting zoonotic infections, as far as we know, um, just because there is fewer close, there's less close contact with animals and humans and it just limits that contact. Um, another really important factor for climate change is something called feed conversion ratio or FCR. And so you'll hear this term a lot when um, you're talking about raising livestock. It is the measurement of one kilogram of feed needed to cause one kilogram of animal weight gain. So if you um, see like a cow as an input output system, not saying that that's what we should refer to cows as, but if you see it as an input output system, how many kilograms of feed do you have to put in to get out um, a, like a significant weight in meat that you can then sell. Um, so the house cricket in one study had an FCR of as low as 0 0.9 to about 1.1. And so when you compare that to beef with a feed conversion ratio of 31.7, that is huge. Um, and so part of that um, is because we consume the entire insect. So we'll eat the entire insect's body whole compared to other livestock where you have to kind of um, butcher and take those pieces of meat um, and the entire animal doesn't get consumed or used in the process. I see someone in the chat. Oh, thank you, Christine. Fascinating. <laughs> um, so yeah, the feed conversion ratio will also depend on the composition of the diets of the diet that the insect is eating. So um, the water that the um, feed for the insect is using, it really just depends. So that's another way that using organic waste as an insect food could be beneficial. And lastly, insects have a way higher reproduction rate than a lot of traditional li livestock and a higher stocking density. So stocking density is just how many individuals can you fit into one um, area. So when you think of um, raising 100 mealworms, you can probably do that in your bedroom, but you can't raise 100 cattle in your bedroom. That would be absurd. Um, so this is another graph that just kind of depicts what I was saying uh, a bit more visually. So it compares land, feed, and water required to produce one kilogram of live animal weight. And it also highlights the percentage of animal that is edible. So um, the percentage of edible animal is noted on the left. Um, and then land is green, feed are the little like green seeds, and the water is just the water droplets. So you can see that um, the two insects on the bottom, which are grasshoppers and mealworms, pick up all significantly less resources than say cattle, um, pork, even chickens. Um, so it's just a nice visual representation of how many um, fewer resources are used by rearing insects. So that kind of wraps up the um, insect portion. Um, does anyone have any like initial questions or thoughts before I kind of tie into um, the Faculty of Learning Food Systems and then kind of start talking about more like academic stuff? 
Um, but if you have any other thoughts, you can always sit in for the end uh, or put them in at any other thought or any other pot part, any other part. Um, but yeah, any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, so yeah, that's it for the insect content. Um, and I always like to plug this photo when I'm presenting because I think it's a fun way to represent land and food system spaces within UBC. So this is a photo from UBC Vancouver campus. Um, this is our student union building called The Nest and um, an LFS based club called Roots on the Roof actually um, maintains this garden on the top of The Nest. And it's just like a really fun event space. Um, and they host a lot of like workshops on how you can garden yourself and a bunch of other fun, wholesome things. So I always like to highlight that. So um, why study in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems? As you can see from this presentation, the um, Faculty of Land and Food Systems addresses local and global issues. And we are actually a smaller faculty within UBC. So we're a pretty tight knit community, which means that it's super easy to make friends and to get to know your profs um, directly, which can be really great for research opportunities or job opportunities. Um, and it's just a very like tight knit community of people who are all pretty like minded, which um, is super wholesome and great. Um, there's so much room for hands on experience that can prepare you for life after graduation. I would say, in my personal opinion, LFS has like more opportunities for hands on learning than a lot of other faculties that I've personally heard about. Um, so one example that I like to tell students is that currently I am in a practicum. So it's the applied biology practicum. It's actually a course that I registered for that I'm getting credits for but I have decided to go out and work at the Wildlife Rescue Association of BC. So I bike out there three days a week and I get to work in their wildlife hospital um, doing like intake exams and helping to like create medication treatment plans for uh, birds that come into our care. So there's lots of great ways to get hands-on experience like that. Um, this kind of just outlines um, what your degree programs and major options are. So if you're applying from high school, you will see that you can apply directly to the Food, Nutrition, and Health program or the Applied Biology program. Um, and major options within Food, Nutrition, and Health include um, Nutritional Sciences, General Food, Nutrition, and Health, Food Science. You can do a double major in Food and Nutritional Sciences or Dietetics. And then uh, within the Applied Biology major, you can do Applied Animal Biology, which is what I'm studying, or Sustainable Agriculture and Environment major. Um, and then at the end of your second year, you have the option to apply to um, two other degree programs, which are Global Resource Systems or Food and Resource Economics. Both of those, you can kind of tailor your interests to your degree. It's not as um, like strict as some other degrees are in terms of like requirements. So Global Resource Systems, you choose a resource and you choose a part of the world. So if you're interested in shark conservation in Mexico, or uh, food security in Northern Canada, you would work with, a, with an advisor one-on-one -on -one and kind of um, choose classes within UBC in order to, oh yeah, sorry, Christine says, uh, you can apply to GRS or FRE after your first year to start in your second year in those programs. Yes, thank you for the correction. Um, but yeah, you would work with an advisor to tailor, tailor your interest to your degree. So you would choose classes that are relevant to your resource in your area um, in order to learn more about it. That's like a language environment or um, other courses like that. And then food and resource economics works similarly, except you are focusing more on things like um, resource limitations or food supply chain or uh, food marketing, uh, which are all very cool interests. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to highlight a faculty, for, a faculty member for this presentation. So this is Dr. Yasmin Akhtar. She is a prof within the Applied Biology program in LFS. Uh, she teaches Applied Biology 290 and 327. So those are uh, respectively the entomophagy course and entomology course. She was the one who kind of kickstarted my interest and many other LFS students' interests in entomophagy. Um, before I took her class, I was so scared of bugs. And like, I hated them, I didn't want to touch them. Um, but she's definitely kind of helped me overcome that fear and actually made me very appreciative of insects for so many different reasons. Um, so a quote I pulled from her is that reluctance is always cultural, but it doesn't take long for people to get used to the flavor and texture of insects. So 
um, yeah, she is like a strong proponent of eating them and using them as a sustainable food source. Um, then jumping back to some admission stuff, if you are applying from grade 12, um, just make sure that um, you have these kind of requirements under your belt so that you are actually eligible to apply. So for grade 12 applicants, make sure you have English 12 or English 12 First Peoples, Pre-Calc 12, or one of the three sciences. Um, if you're applying from, or and make sure that from grade 11, you have your English 11 or English 11 First Peoples, Pre-Calc 11 or Foundations of Math 12, Chemistry 11 and Physics 11. Um, and then we have some notes on post-secondary transfer as well, if that applies to you. Um, of course, all of this information is on our website at landfood.ubc.ca, um, and I'll highlight that website as well later on, uh, if anyone needs to reference it. Um, and then a note, our application deadline for UBC is January 15th, and December 1st is the early admission application deadline um, to be considered for scholarships. These are all things I've already said, but yeah, if you need to get in touch, sorry, get in touch, have any advising related questions, you can um, email that email, students at landfood.ubc.ca. Um, definitely follow us on Instagram. We do a lot of fun content. We have some farm tours coming up. We have cooking segments all the time. Um, there's just so much fun, wholesome content on there at UBC LFS. And again, if you need any of this information, it is all there at landfood.ubc.ca. So awesome. I love whoever is checkmarking. That's amazing.